Welcome to the Yo Podcast, an interview series where we spotlight leading designers, developers, and makers. I'm your host, Rob Hope, and today we have Rasmus Anderson, a seasoned designer and software developer integral to startups like Spotify, Facebook, Dropbox, and Figma. Rasmus also dedicated thousands of hours to creating Inter, one of the world's most loved typefaces used by NASA, GitHub, Pixar, and more. In this episode, we dive into his next chapter, a fun and ambitious operating system called Playbit. We also discuss quality AI use cases, what makes a great programmer, how to get started with your first typeface, and what are the signs of upcoming burnout if you're involved in a startup. Yo, Rasmus, welcome to the Yo Podcast, my man. Hey, thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. So if I was to time warp to Sweden in the early 90s, would I find a young Rasmus parting, smashing curry banana pizzas and contributing to the flogster scream (laughs) in the city? Or would I find him deep at home in his Perl programming book trying to code his first website? Oh, definitely more programming or designing or computers, like as a lot of computers and like making things or Xeroxing magazines or making movies. We made a lot of like movies like videos you know like a camcorder pre-digital I, th- I couldn't i couldn't recall it again like when i was seeing the research but i swear you said something on twitter about your grandfather drove a vw bug or something and like delivered it to the king or yeah yeah that was me he did it twice actually so the swedish king was and still is like a big car collector and my grandfather he worked for volkswagen after the second world war and yeah, he delivered a, the first beetle I think he had the first Beatles, so technically the second Beatles to the Swedish king. And then later on, when, you know, Porsche came around, he delivered the first 911 to the uh, Swedish king. But I think that, I think we kind of made a yoke. So like in Sweden, you, it's kind of a, 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 a tall, narrow country. So you have like these yeah, yeah. kind of three large cities, but you have two, the two biggest cities, they're like kind of opposite ends of each of the coast. So you have the Stockholm on the East Coast, you have Gothenburg on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. And that part of my family grew up in Gothenburg. And if you grew up in Gothenburg, then you think people in Stockholm are just like ridiculous. And if you grew up in Stockholm, you think people in Gothenburg are ridiculous. And my grandfather really thought they were ridiculous. So in his entire life, I think he only visited Stockholm three times and twice was just for work, right? That we just <laughs> talked about. And once I think was, I can't remember what it was, but that was like a, a thing when he was still alive, you know, sometimes we would giggle about this and he was like, yeah, there's, why would you ever go to Stockholm? It's so stubborn. <laughs> I lived in Stockholm for 10 years. Like, yeah, it was like such a funny guy. Should we just break into a game? Sure. Cool. This game is called No Context. Mm. Okay. I, re- I have no context on this game. So it's very, very fitting. I'm going to shoot you two options. And all you need to do is shoot back one of them, no context given, and no context needed, or no explanation needed why you chose it. You got it. Got it. The first time you drove around the Laguna Seca track or snowboarding a glacier in Girlho Pigeon. Ah, uh, snowboarding. Oh yeah. Kerning or tracking? Kerning? Good kerning, no need for tracking. <laughs> Seeing your photography published in the New York Times or seeing Inter used by NASA? Oh, Inter by NASA. Oh my God. Yeah, big, big deal. ABBA or Ace of Base? Uh, Ace of Base, yeah. Ace of Base is pretty cool. Formula One or World Rally Championship? Oh, rally any time of the day. That's where the real drivers are. Archive.org or Wikipedia.org? Archive.org. Your dad bringing home the IBM 12-inch monochrome with windows on it? Or your grandfather giving you that Kodak Pocket Instamatic? Uh, Kodak Pocket Instamatic. Life-changing. Windows XP or Windows 95? Uh, Windows 95. Website preloaders or scroll jacking? <laughs> preloaders for sure. Any day of the week. <laughs> Red bathroom, self-portrait or Jerry on the wall? Jerry on the wall, I'm going to answer. I don't remember what that is, but... I'll die to find uh, out later. Was, it was with a uh, photo of the guy kick flipping down the stairs, I think. Black and white photo. I'm I'm surprised. Like you found out so much that I, I don't I didn't even remember some of these things, you know? That's amazing. 
Okay, Game Boy or Nintendo? Uh, like Nintendo Entertainment System. Yeah, yeah, not Game Boy. My brother was into Game Boy. I didn't really get it. I get it now though, but not then. Spotify or Shopify? No context. Spotify. <laughs> and lastly, tabs or spaces? Uh, tabs. I, I, honestly, I don't care. I do both. Rewind many moons. Okay, I got a degree in information systems. And one of my subjects was programming with Delphi. And okay. I had a final exam and I had to program a traffic light going from red to orange to green. And I learned it out of this thick book. And my final exam was was on a piece of paper. Okay. So, you know, I know you've had your humble beginnings from um, basic at 11, Pearl at 14, and so on, so on, so on. You know, nowadays, juniors have the luxury of this like massive catalog of technologies that they can just basically plug in and just shortcut so much. But, but, but it comes with its downsides. You know, our constraints allowed us to, you know, think out the box, allowed us to get creative and so on. I want to know what's a great approach for a junior now to start a non-bias, pragmatic developer career? That's a really good question. It's a big one. Honestly, I think it's like what what it comes down to is like uh, if you enjoy doing what you're doing, right? It's it's Sorry, this is a cop-out and I'm going to get to a more concrete answer to your great question, but I think generally speaking, people who like do interesting things and people you want to learn from, at least from my perspective, like are people who enjoy doing that, right? And so like how you got there is like less important. Okay, practically, I think you can start in one of a couple of different places. Like one, you just like build something. You just pick something up. I don't know. For me, it was just, I saw a magic thing like in, in a web browser. It said CGI. This is a long history not the case anymore but it used to be so that when a website was interactive it said cgi bin in the address bar and I, I no one i knew knew anything about computers and one day i went to the library or the bookstore and the book had that on it and i was like okay this book got to be about the magic thing that happened so i bought that book and that was like my that was like my little sort of like a little toe through the door right so like finding something like that and then just making something and then you're gonna have to make I mean, it's like hard to hear, I think, but you're going to have to make not five things before you make a good thing. You're going to have to make probably 5,000 things before you make a good thing. And making 5,000 things is going to go faster than you think. But so that's one path. Another one, I think, that that is really useful that I, I did not start in this place, but I could see myself doing that in a different parallel universe, different life, which is like the, you know, the education first path, like data structures algorithms understanding like how memory works and how computers work and like all these fundamental things that maybe you don't do a lot of day to day as a software engineer have been like vastly helpful to then understand like what is uh, I, I, I'm not going to say possible but like what is like really affordable and what is really expensive in terms of like doing on a, on a screen on a, in a UI right or in a video game or whatever like having that understanding there's a couple of other paths, but like, I think those are two very obvious ones. Either you just go build something, you just keep making things, you just keep doing things. You gotta get better and better. And there's a there's a great thing if you're interested in this path. Like, there's something called taste the taste gap. But I think Ira Glass, the NPR guy, um, you'll look it up. It's it's like relevant in this uh, catching that up. And then sort of the educational path, you know, like creating a good foundation. And then going from there and like starting out with a better understanding rather than like the intuitive path. I don't know, Rob. How would you how would you think about that? If if I gave you the same question, what what would your answer be? Like, how, where would you start? I want to give something non generic, but uh, you got to focus where your curiosity is. Like, you got to start there because that gives you unlimited fuel and unlimited motivation. Yeah. Like you're never gonna dip. And when it gets difficult. I, I feel like in parallel, you should try get, you know, the teaching and so on. So it's like, try, like learn a chapter, build something like, like sort of like at the same time versus, oh, I'm just going to put my head down learn theory. Like I did Delphi. That sucked, dude. It's like build something I'm trying to and do. I and then it's like, oh, I'm struggling with this. Then learn a bit. I mean, cheap is the, like I could, I'm not a great coder, you know, I can code 
you know, I code a one page love, WordPress themes, little JavaScript and stuff. But the way Chat ChatGPT is like just helping me now, it's just like cheating, dude. Like I feel like I've just skipped so many fundamentals. And then when I'm actually running into real trouble, like I'm in big trouble. Cause it's like, <laughs> you know, I, I don't totally understand like why this is messing up. And, I, and I'm just like pumping it in, pumping it in. But like, what if I change this? So I would say like where your curiosity is, you got to aim there, you got to solve a problem you have somehow. And then obviously, just start the smallest thing possible. Like Dang. the first thing I ever did was a case converter online. I bought caseconverter.com. And it's like, at the time, clients were giving me these Word documents with all capitals and stuff. And there wasn't a lot of native solutions back then. I think this was like 2008 or something, 2006. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I just wanted a clean solution online and I built it, you know, I got a friend to help me code and there it was, dude. And that, that felt so good. Cool, next, change this proper case, sentence case, you know, as I go, like learning, learning. So it's, and then having that live and having other people actually do it and, and giving you that feedback loop as well and like trying to understand, you know, why are they even suggesting these things? Like that's when you start becoming a product builder and I feel like, yeah, that's probably a good start. That's really interesting to hear what you're saying, kind of like the, the curiosity, I agree. I think that's a great one, like to have that. And, you know, you can think about it as like, how do I get cur curious? I think everyone are curious. So maybe, maybe like the thing to ask oneself is like, what am I curious about? Right. And finding that curiosity, if it's not already up obvious to you, start there. And then with the, the starting small, like when I was listening to what you were saying, I was like imagining or picturing sort of like a, almost like a metaphor analogy of like cooking, you know, a kitchen, like say you want to get in and get really good at cooking, right? Like if you, if you get to make something really, really complicated, Right, you you most definitely going to feel that this is too hard, mm. right? You kind of like scale in this like crazy cliff. Let's say you start with something really really simple and think it's maybe easier to relate to food because it's something everyone share. Uh, everyone has some relationship to food and like imagine doing that and you gotta serve some food to some of your friends, right? There's so much involved. It's almost like it's almost like think of a of, um, uh, of a a graphical thing, right? You get a little dot in the middle and you have all of these other little dots around this dot. That that whole experience, what with case converter, right? The case converter experience was not the program that did the case conversion was the dot in the middle. But then there's all of the other things around, right? With the meal, it's like, yeah, you have your omelet or whatever it is. But then it's like how you play it and making sure you time it so it's not cold when it's served. And like yeah. making sure that like you got the right salt in there and maybe you pair it with something else, right? And, there's like so much around it. And I think training that kind of muscle is really useful for when we go and take on bigger projects. A huge shout out to our season sponsor, Webflow, who allow us to build websites with the power of code without writing any. You can take control of a website's HTML code, CSS styles, and JavaScript animations, all within a stunning visual canvas. Webflow has also launched localization an end-to-end -end solution for customizing your site for a worldwide audience. You can build with localized content directly in the designer. As you add locales, for example, French, you can easily switch between them and preview how each site looks for each before publishing. It's great to know you can customize static pages and CMS content specifically for a language. Furthermore, you can add localized images and alt text. You can show or hide certain elements and you can even adjust typography and styles per locale to accommodate for different length headlines, fonts, and more. Webflow is totally free to get going, and you only start paying when you need to go live. Head over to webflow.com for your next website build. I think, uh, you know, there was even like knives and forks for the UX, you know? <laughs> it's like you're serving food, but you don't even know how they're going to interact with the site or how they're going to eat this food. Yeah. Your next chapter is play, play a bit. Fun operating system for software professionals and hobbyists. That's I, I like that tagline, man. It's like it just feels so friendly, appro approachable. Hobbyist is such a good word. You've got funding, you're hiring, you're deep, dude. Mm -hmm. This is it. Okay, I got a question here from Jorn van Dijk from Framer. <laughs> oh, I know Jorn. Yeah, <laughs> this got to be a good question, I'm sure. <laughs> um, it's a kind of a two part question. I've added a little bit in the end myself. What's your secrets to actually shipping your side projects? and have them be high quality. And, and secondly, do you feel that having some venture backing actually contributes a positive amount of anxiety to get this ambitious <laughs> project out the door? Two good questions. 
Well, the first one, also, thank you, Jorn. That means a lot coming from you. I mean, I, I look at Jorn as like, you know, someone who is like at the very top of, uh, you know, world-class quality person. So it really means an ocean to hear this. But I stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of like ideas. A friend of mine who is really good at this, I asked him, this was a long time ago, I don't know, 10 years ago, he just had his, uh, I think, second kid. You know, he was doing a full-time job, take care of his kids and cranking out these awesome side projects. And I was like, dude, how do you do this? You know, like how, like, and at the time, like I was like single, just working all the time. I had like basically all of the free time, right? And he said, well, at 8 p.m., the kids have gone to bed. And then I have two hours before I need to go to bed. And that's, those are my two hours. Those are holy to me. And he said, I don't have time to think about what to do when I sit down at the computer. So he said, he he's like, I've developed this thing where I, I take notes in my mind. And so when I sit down at the computer, it's two hours of only executing. Wow. It's like I sit down and I start writing the program or I start designing the thing. I don't think about like, what should I, how should I solve this? And obviously that's like a muscle that like you, you have to like train. It's something that takes a long time. So that is something I've been doing and that is working pretty well for me. Um, very intentional. Yeah. Another, another trick that works well for me is to tricking myself. And this is, has to do, I think with like the idea of taste and, and being very critical of my own work. Like when I was younger, I would publish like a lot of stuff. And that as I, as I grew professionally older, I would publish less and less over time. And I think this is like true for most of my peers who I've had this conversation with. It's kind of, if you imagine a two-dimensional graph, you know, with like a line graph, it kind of goes from, you have one axis, like how, how like actually good are you? And another axis, how much do you publish? And they're inverse, they correlate it. So good. And so that I think is like I'm tricking myself to not think about that, not be so critical about my own stuff. And so sort of like, when I look at something I made today, almost always do I feel like this is shit and I shouldn't share it. Or I think, it, and it's not, for me at least and no judgment to anyone else here but like for me it's not interesting what other people think in terms of like a brand or anything like that it's like it's only in the light of like is anyone ever gonna find this useful like ugh, I've, this is ridiculous no like that this is so weird now i'm not gonna do this or i'm like you know talking about maybe the context menu is not so great and sometimes talk about how context menus generally are like suck and i I can't publish like something with a bad context menu. Like I'm, I'm like a, you know, I'm like lying, right? You got to do as you say. But then I got to trick myself and be like, okay, I'm just gonna like put this out. I'm just gonna see, you know, I just kind of leave it, make a little package. And and the third trick I'll share is like time boxing. Like I'll try to, I always have a bunch of things going on at work, like in my life, my hobbies, and I try to like like box up a piece of time before I start working on something. So like if I if I decide and work on on like uh, the interface, I might decide that like okay, I'm gonna, I'm uh, like after lunch on this Sunday, I'm just gonna like work until like um, I don't know five p.m. or something. So I'm gonna spend three hours, and I just pick up whatever like I need to do. And when the clock hits five, I'm just gonna go do something else. And uh, it sounds so obvious and easy to do, but it's actually I at least I find it to be like pretty hard to do in practice. Um, but really helpful has been helpful for me. What about the feeling of, of it being incomplete? Like, are you not trying to handpick something that you could actually tick mm -hmm. in that three hours after lunch on a Sunday? That, yeah, I love that way of thinking about it. This is something that I think is very different depending on the specific thing you're working with. With like, with typography, for example, something that I find so delightful about it, it's similar to like um, Zelda Breath of the Wild on the Nintendo Switch, which is, I can spend three minutes or maybe not three, five minutes, say five minutes. I can spend five minutes right now on some interesting and feel satisfied, right? That I made some progress. I could spend like, or two hours, you know, there's a lot of programming things where two hours is like too little. If all I have is two hours, I'm not even going to bother trying to even open a text editor to work on this because the, the like thinking about it, it's a stack of pancakes or whatever, like a stack of cards in your mind, right? It's like some projects require a pretty like tall stack of things before you can start putting another like card on the deck, right? 
and I'm not I'm not saying that like topography is for like dummies like me and engineering is for like other smart people. DC is different beasts and different like types of like shapes of things, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's a real struggle. And I'm sure I mean you've got a lot of experience yourself, so I'm curious to hear this from you. But like it's almost like before getting to that spot, like just knowing about this, right? Certain things are gonna be harder to feel satisfied about. Yeah. Picking the things that fit into that time box that you have. I don't know if you've got any like frameworks or, or ways of thinking about avoiding that situation of feeling unsatisfied, you know? Man, I mean, that's just a demon inside of you. But uh, it's it's like right now I've got a home office and um, I I have the the prince, you know, like he he controls the household. So <laughs> sitting on the self <laughs> throne, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I'm telling you, dude, the other day I, I closed the door, I was so busy and I, I heard him like tapping on the door and then he started crying and I was like, oh man, this, this is over, dude. But like, honestly, the, the, the type of stuff, I mean, it is a luxury if you got that kind of work where you can actually just quickly do that. I mean, a lot of the time it's so difficult to understand how, how long something's truly going to take. Mm -hmm. And you know, they always talk about that last little polish and then it's, that's 80% of the time. It's like, what are, what are we trying to do? Are we just trying to get something light out the door and just trying to get a little validation or just like see what happens? Are we actually going to do polish? Because polish has got to be like deep work. Mm -hmm. And for me, often when it's starting a day, when it's like, oh my God, I know I'm going to get two hours. I just got to do the most difficult thing first. Mm -hmm. Like the thing I don't want to do. Um, and I know it's been hounding me, but it doesn't mean I want to like do that one. So it, it's like a big juggle. Like, but Sunday afternoon, dude, it's like... I, I'm going to be working on something I really want to work on. And if it, like if it's, it. Yeah, it's different times of day. Um, nighttime as well, that's definitely like play some music, like get some design work done. Uh, no interruptions. I get so many interruptions in the day. I'm, I Dude, next year I got to get I got to get office. I just got to get out of here, dude. <laughs> oh, I feel you. Yeah, I work from home as well. And it's the se and also the mental separation there. It's hard if like yeah. it's, a, it's a door or like a curtain or whatever separates your like personal life from your work life. That's that's a fussy line, you know? So Jord had two questions, right? Yeah. And secondly, do you feel that having some venture backing actually contributes a positive amount of anxiety to getting an ambitious project like Play a Bit? Of course, there's different like levels, but mm -hmm. like this is your new baby. Like this is no you're in charge. There's no one telling you like the, the launch date. So a little venture banking, let's get some pressure on. Yeah, I think it's it's thanks for repeating it. Like I think it's uh it's well it's a really good question because it it's not really about like the venture backing here i think it's about like positive stress or sort of like a sense of urgency which i think is very important and i think it's important to find the right level right for like a hobby project you can artificially create that or sy synthetically create that by just like you know as we were just talking about setting like a deadline for yourself right setting a, a very tight scope essentially constraints right in a way it's a type of constraint and if the constraints are too tight or they're too like too inflexible essentially, or if they're or if they're too few and too loose, like we kind of like fall out of that kind of flow state, right? Where we feel really excited. So in that, in that mindset, I think it certainly is re really useful. I mean, that's not why Playbit is a company. I think that would be maybe a, like the wrong way of like the, the wrong reasons for starting a company. Uh, but it certainly help, it helps, I think. I had before this, I, I had a little bit of lunch before we had this conversation. But before that, I had a just one of these catch-up meetings with one of our investors. And I think what will venture backing or you know whatever you want to call it, like have, basically having investors in a company. Why I think that's really helpful is so you have all of these other people who are now invested in a really positive way, not in like a I want money out of this way, but like I am here because as an investor, you know. I am here because like, I'm really curious about this and I want to be part of that journey. And that is like a great, for me, it's like a great source of, uh, of energy, you know? Yes. And like, you I mean, you've got quite a history with connected startups. Did you handpick these investors? Are they, are they your friends? Less pressure? Some of them are my friends. Some of them are firms. It's uh, I, it's just like a, a a really really good bunch of people. Great. I met everyone. Some I obviously some I know from before. Some I've sort of like got to know now as they became investors. Especially some of the people from the firms. And it's yeah, not a single person is like oh I I wish 
they wouldn't have invested. It's like, damn, like this is like amazing. Or this one person is just like an incredible insight, you know? I got a question here from a Jan Edern Gillett from Linear. Hey, Rasmus, what are the key differences between working on operating systems and apps? Mm. I think that the answer will differ a little bit based on a perspective from like an engineering perspective or a design perspective. But thinking about assuming out, I'm, I'm not sure where to start here, but like an operating system is really just like another piece of software, right? It's not an operating system. It's not like some magical code that runs somewhere. It's just like another program. I think the biggest difference from a development perspective is it's not a program that runs in another program, right? We're pretty used to having a bunch of software around us that sort of like catches us when we fall, so to speak. A bunch of like things on the screen, if you want to imagine that way, that hangs around there as you restart your program, right? But an operating system, at least in a very traditional sense of the operating system, that is you, you got hardware and then you have your operating system. I'm simplifying things a lot here, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Great. But the experience is a little bit like that when developing. So certain things that feel really easy or are like relatively easy, like just debugging something, for example. How do you debug a kernel? Like that is that is not as easy as debugging a program that's already running in the OS. The design part of it is like it I think it really depends on A what you define and what you think of as being an operating system. And I have my own opinions, but they're pretty loosely held. And I know that it varies pretty widely between people what they think it is. So that's on one hand. And the other part is like how much you enjoy like working on things that people don't notice. So I think like the best operating system is the one where people never notice your hard work, right? And for some people, that's like, I would never want that. I'm not saying that, but I'm, you know, as some person, some people like the personality, like I want to make an icon that is beautiful. And when people see it, they feel delighted, even if they don't know it's me, like that, you know, emotional connection. And I can relate to this and some of my other work, right? Um, but I think with an operating system, when everything is working well, it's like what people expect and no one is no one is really surprised or delighted or whatever. Yeah, it's intuitive. Yeah. And so it's really, really extremely utilitarian, right? So a lot of the design work in an operating system is making sure that people don't notice that, right? Rather than like, you know, uh, how what the window decorations look like. I mean, that's like that's like an afternoon, right? Then there's like five years of other things that is the iceberg underneath. So like designing an app, would you say there's a slight sway to, towards you want to make an app a bit fancy where operating system is like, it's kind of just more raw and needs to work bare bones? Uh, maybe, I don't know if I'll put it that way. So let's see, if you are to define an operating system as like almost like the, the landscape in which you put plant trees and the apps are trees, right? This is, I, I just came up with this metaphor now and I realized this is like a highly flawed metaphor. And <laughs> but let's take it, let's <laughs> no, take it along and for a ride no, and I see where say, it goes. I was saying like, oh, you're, I was like, you're in trouble. Yeah, I've been trouble. This is not going to go up. But okay, so I think in, you know, in this like garden, right? You got like a, an, a garden that's kind of the, the operating system. You got the trees, there are the apps. Like I think, and then you have someone who like enjoys this garden people will probably have like a bad experience if the whole ground is slanting and when they put down their share, which is like another app and this weird metaphor, they kind of roll over, right? And they'll be like, damn it, ground, which is the OS. And when everything just work, works fine, they will be like, this tree is really beautiful, you know? Or like, I wish there was an oak tree here to cover like the stark sun, right? And there's an oak tree and they're like delighted or they need it, right? Or like, I'm hungry, I need a tomato plants, right? And so I think what would... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, with apps, like I think you you are much closer to the person's needs. And generally in my work, I, I kind of like that type of thing, right? When I can find like um, a way of creating affinity to like the other specific human being who is like using the thing I, I worked on, right? That's Figma. Like I worked at, at, at Facebook a long time ago and some of that work was satisfying in this way, but a lot wasn't where... A change that I made had an, you know, maybe affected a billion people, right? But like the emotional, the emotional like uh, impact was perceived to me to, to be zero, right? It's, it's completely anonymous. Like I see the stats, I see the numbers, I understand the business like numbers or whatever. We like, 
we changed this one variable somewhere and like now we made like a million dollars more a day or you know something like this whatever it is you can understand the impact but you can't feel it and then on some other projects i the, i i couldn't see any impact at all on like the you know that sort of the the technical aspect but i could i can get a lot of that sort of the the emotional impact right and so for me it's I'm trying to file a balance and I think working on an operating system has like a little less of that emotional impact feedback, which is, you know, one of the challenges uh, for me at least. We've got a question here from Rid from Figma Academy and the Dive podcast. And he says, so you started working on Playbit before anyone was really talking about AI and now it's transforming roadmaps seemingly overnight. So can you talk a bit about how your vision and product strategy has evolved over the last few years and what the driving forces have been. Yeah, this is a big, possibly loaded question. I like it. I don't think I agree that Playbit was started before the AI thing. I think that the AI thing, um, it depends on where, where, you know, what perspective you have. But in my opinion, it's been brewing for for quite a while. And so at least certainly when I, when I left Figma to go like work on Playbit, AI like was on the horizon. It was an interesting thing, and we have thought about like AI and how that relates to like the future and what do we believe that is and what like role does it play? What what even is it in an operating system? And even since Playbit, even when it was just an idea and it was like some you know slides for getting feedback from friends about like what should it even be? Even at that point, there was some AI to it. I personally, again, I think it's a big question. This one, right? Do I even believe in AI? Where do I stand on that? Is Am I like a doomer? Am I an exceller? Whatever. I, I don't care, right? Like, I think it's clearly like a real thing. I'm really excited what happens. I'm like hesitant to just like dive in somewhere because I don't know if anyone has an idea just yet of what is that right like shape? What is that like thing? It's Everything is blobless and it changes week to week. And we're sort of like, you know, there's like a, a metaphor I like, relating to this obviously we're all having conversations about ai these last couple of years but like i think about when the moving picture camera came around right like someone took like a regular photographic you know camera and they put like a you know roll and a, and a crank on it and now you can you can record many pictures and you know you can play it back and you can sort of like see uh, they didn't call it a movie guess but like a moving pictures right and the first applications of this new technology was on things that people are familiar with. So what they would do was in a theatrical play, they would where people sit in the seats, they would just put a camera in the seat and they would record a theater, right? And at this point, there was no art form called movie. It was just recorded theater. And then someone figured out that they can take this like this new technology, the new, the film camera, and they can make that an actor in the theater play. And that's when like you had a new a new art form that forked off theater. So now you have theater distinct from movies, you know? And I feel that like with the AI, we are right there. Now. We have this moving future camera. We're putting it in the seat. We're recording our theater plays, right? Like we're putting it, we're making shot thoughts. We're like, we're in, we're trying to control it with what we are familiar with, which is like this like one dimensional text input, right? There's like text prompts. And we're trying to apply it to stuff that, that the shot of this that we have right now today, right? But what I think is going to happen is like in the next 10 years, maybe 20, someone will figure out how to like, fork it maybe i wouldn't call it a new art form but certainly like just a different set of like shapes of problems or, or challenges to solve with it and i think then with play babe we want to be ready and like embrace that whatever it is right but do that into a place where it fits really well rather than like let's put like an llm and an os and just like help you like basically a clippy that doesn't suck like that i don't think it's like very helpful um i don't know what what do you think like are you I don't really know, actually. Like, where are you on the whole AI spectrum? I dig the analogy. It it brought me back, or, or it made me think to maybe when you were back in the day, you know, bashing heads or like really brainstorming with a lot of big minds in these startups, and they have seen the show. Like, this came in different shapes or forms back in the day, and they probably went like, "That's a distraction." Like, like, why did we start doing this? Um, like, why are we building this operating system? You know, like, we're not doing it to create this form of, like, AI quick, uh, just we'll just do it for you. No, we actually want to have fun building. 
And it's like, if anything is like sort of going to steer us away from like our primary goals, like, no, dude, can wait. Let's see what happens there. But like, this is why we start. Like, why do we start this? So I'm sure it, it's come in many shapes and forms. I know like with Website Builders, which is, you know, more my space and, you know, Webflow is my main sponsor, One Page Love. It's like, I've seen the builders just say, oh, like we're going to do AI and it's so watered down and shit. It's almost like bad for the AI brand itself. Is it? Because it's like, that is so bad. Like no one's shipping this. It's actually way, like sometimes it's so bad. It's like you get angry because it's like, this is such a waste of time. Is it? Um, and then, but then it's like someone like Webflow and I will give them the props, but like they've been holding back that. They've just been holding back. They just, they're like, this is not ready. This is no, dude. And all the competition, AI, 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 and like, they're just like, dude, we're not ready, man. Like we cannot, like we have a brand, we have integrity. What are we even trying to do? So in your case, like, and, and, and my opinion on AI, yeah, it's amazing to speed up certain things, to, to take a, a podcast research and brainstorm certain things about Sweden where I don't get <laughs> all advertising. And like, I'm using it like every day. It's, it's great, but uh, it's still wrong. I still have to fact check everything. Yeah. Um. So for for junior programming stuff, great man. Um. But dude, no, it's a, it's honestly a distraction in everything I'm trying to do online. Fifth. So it's speeding me up, but it's like I want to interact with people. Yeah. I I think like it's it's easy it's easy to look at the whole AI stuff happening as something that kind of dilutes the human experience, which I think we we both, Rob, you and I care a lot about. Um. But I think another way of looking at it is that if we do it right, it might actually like give us a, like a much better life with more richer human experience by the AI taking care of the stuff that is not that today, right? Like think about like the, the act of writing programs, like most of it is, is like a solitude type of thing, right? It's like something that doesn't give you a lot of that. And also like programming, if you take that as an example, it's also extremely structured, right? It has to be because computers are very, very dumb. I mean, there, there's, there isn't even like a dumb spectrum of computers, just, you know, a conveyor belt that just does what the next thing says, right? And so it has to be extremely structured. And in that diversity, ideas, weirdness, quirks, the whatever we, you know, uh, quantify the, 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 the nice human stuff is gone, right? Mostly. And so take that as a feel like, if we now have AI that we can use to just like write in this program, right? Maybe not all of it, maybe like 80% of it. Let's say instead of we spend five days or four days a week writing programs, we spend four hours a week writing programs. That Now we got like three days extra where we maybe we can spend that time with like people. Because That's a good thing. There's like no, there's no future. Maybe there's some like really dark scenarios of the future, but like, no future that they, I subscribe to at least where like an AI is just so good that they will create the thing that I want, right? Like th we still have expert like sign makers. We still have like incredible musical artists, right? Recording artists. There's like photographers. There's like all kinds of stuff where there's already been technological innovation that has erased a lot or typography, right? That has erased a lot of what previously required a very high level of like education and skill to get it done, right? But it's not like that disappeared, right? There's still people who enjoy like LP records, right? It's just like the market is just smaller and I think that's the, gotta be the reality, but it doesn't mean that like our future is like doomed. It means that like the choice of where to enjoy like a rich life will be maybe fewer, but they won't be, they won't be missing it, I think. I always like the extension of an arm analogy. It's like, just, it's like right there. Just like, if you need it, it just like, just helps you get there quicker, 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 quicker. Um, the programming side, I mean, for me being like a pretty average programmer, it's, it's, in, it's phenomenal. $20 a month, phenomenal. And like so insanely fast, like Stack Overflow back in the day, I would, I just copying and pasting stuff, putting in my sublime text, like breaking, breaking, breaking. Now it's just, I'm like, dude, what is wrong with this code? They're like, this is what's wrong with your code. Um, I go in now and I'll, I'll script a podcast intro. I'll just be like, I really like it. Like, don't change it a lot, but just tighten it up a little bit. And I'll take my intro from a six to an eight, yeah. six to an eight out of 10. And in like five seconds. And like that for me is just so helpful. Just remove like that and like bad grammar, but yes, Grammarly and all that stuff exists. But, uh, one, another really good one is like, 
I want to hard code these YouTube timestamps in my newsletter. So all the topics um, just ha are like directly linked out. But this is the YouTube timestamp like kind of format, which has the, the T equals like 425, you know? And it's like, but these are the times. And then it's just like five seconds. It's just like the list for me. And that was something that like someone would take like a good 20 minutes to do and work out. So for me, yeah, dude, like being a solo dude and just like trying to stay light and lean, yeah. fantastic. But I hear what you're saying, man. Like it's not, it, the, the stuff we really truly enjoy is no. never going to end. The time step example, I think is great. It's like no one finds joy in that type of work. Yeah. And it, that's like, that's, that's, I think what machines, the role machines should play, right? I'm not talking about some sci-fi sentient machines. That's not what I mean with machines, but like machines as tools. Yeah. That's what they should do, right? They should take the the thing that like is not the essence of like enjoying life and take care of that for us. And it, sh it shouldn't like make us like these. I, one thing, I don't know if this is a segue or like if I'm like totally off the rails here, but like. I love it, dude. Go. Zavi, I, I, I feel like uh, somewhat of an anxiety about having also being sort of a new parent like yourself, like, and just my own experience in life is. Oof. It's this kind of like uh, society getting almost addicted to software, right? You go to a cafe. You used to go, be able to go to a cafe. And like one of the reasons I went to a cafe was to like be around other people, right? I can like make a coffee. I made a coffee now. I can make a coffee at home, right? That's not why I go to a cafe. But today you go to a cafe and everyone are like in their rectangles, you know? They're like, ooh, what's happening on my rectangle? And it's bad. Yeah, and it's like people are not bad, right? It's not like people are dumb or bad or anything like that. It's like a drug like anything else, you know? If you start putting sugar in your coffee and sugar and buying bread with sugar and stuff, then before you know it, you're just going to like not want to have things without sugar in them. And now you like are addicted to sugar, right? And it's like you didn't do really anything wrong. You just didn't actively do something about it, right? And so I don't know. I don't know where this leads in this conversation or, or like in a greater scheme, but like it's something that I think quite a lot about and I feel uneasy about it, you know? Yeah, it is fascinating. I mean, we're both, you know, new new dads and like, you know, I chat to my dad about this and, you know, when people are debating, oh, I don't know what, I have a kid, you know, bring in this world of technology and like what's going to happen with the spaceships <laughs> and flying cars and stuff. But my dad said the exact same thing happened when, when I was, you know, when I was a conversation yeah, to be born. You know, he's like, no ways, you know, new, newspapers doing this or like, can you believe this? The cars are doing this. And it's, it is a fear, but from a social interacting point of view for years and years and years, people looked each other in the eyes and had good uh -huh. conversations. And that is, that is fading a considerable amount. Or even going on the subway. Yeah, man. Like, like you just to just like, like spark bus. up a conversation. So, I mean, traveling alone. Versus traveling with someone else, you understand? Know, but now it's like you're always traveling alone because everyone's just with someone else on, on their screen. I like that. So interesting. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Let's break into a little intermission. It's called overrated, underrated. I'm going to shoot you a brand, a person, a topic, and you just need to fire back if you feel it's overrated, underrated, or properly rated if you feel like the public has an even eye on it. Okay, so overrated, underrated, properly rated. So it's like up, <laughs> down. Pretty yeah, much, you got like it. it. Variable fonts. Um, oof. Middle rated. I think people are like right on right now. Mm. Bitcoin. Overrated. Two-factor authentication. Well rated. Legit. Not exciting. GoPros. Maybe underrated, actually. Yeah, GoPros are pretty awesome. Porsche. Is that the front of the house or the car brand? Or Sorry, it's a pronunciation. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> the, the car My brand? My South African Porsche. Yeah, that's the car brand for sure. Uh, in between. A chat GPT. Um, a little bit overrated, but well, maybe in between, actually. It's like pretty legit. Open Sans, the typeface. Uh, well, I haven't used OpenSAS. I don't have a strong opinion about it, so I'm going to say it's probably well-rated. It's uh, pretty popular, huh? I know, it's very popular, <laughs> yeah. Pour over coffee. Uh, underrated. Nice. Organic wine. Um, is that the same as natural wine? Because, like... Natural wine. My Swedish friends are all into that, and I think it's vastly overrated, <laughs> so... Um, teenage engineering. Uh, always underrated. Play date by Panic. 
Oh, it breaks my heart, but it is overrated. I have one. I don't use it, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, but it's overrated. It's that color, man. Um, so Mastodon. Uh, it is overrated. Yeah, I think for complicated reasons. A Swedish semlo. Oof. Uh, I mean, uh, underrated if your metabolism is very high. <laughs> Otherwise, you probably <laughs> shouldn't think twice. <laughs> Design engineer as a job title. Uh, I think it's like fine. It's like middle rated. Like call yourself whatever. Whatever floats your boat, man. Having a typeface on Google fonts. Middle rated. It has its caveats. It has its pros. And lastly, online privacy. Uh, underrated. You know, I'm diving in your website and it's a gold mine for research. Gold mine. Um, if I'd never <laughs> one year old, I reckon I would have borrowed for days, dude. There's also just this the craziest stuff. You know, there's folders called yeah. stuff. <laughs> and it's just filled with stuff. Like just random screenshots. There's, there's Game Boy screenshots. So, uh, I mean, back to the, the, the question in the game. But like, do you think we're, we've kind of oversensitive online to online privacy when it comes to our own personal sharings? I think it's like, it's one of these things that, that it's, it's a complicated, that it's or complex rather that it's, uh, it's like hard to have an interesting conversation about it. I think what, I, why I can't, why I think it's like underrated is I think more for maybe business reasons or lack of a better term, like, um, user experience, almost like, um, you know, some people are kind of following this idea of like local first software, which, you know, I think is a great thing thinking about like lock in. There's another like dimension here to kind of what I'm trying to to talk about. Like if if I or like owning your own data is not as important as controlling your own data, right? Like I don't actually want to like maintain backups on physical drives that I have to store in a cold space at home and keep away from like magnetism or whatever, you know, like that job is like not something I want, but I want to have control over my files, right? Something that I think is just sort of really sucks about today versus like 15 years ago is on Spotify. If I like save a song to a playlist and the record label pulls it away, which they do, which is like such a messed up practice, that song is gone now and I lose it. Right. And that to me, it's like a simple example maybe, but that to me, I think is something like genuinely like bad, but we've come to just take that for granted now or like a Figma thing, right? Like you work at a company and like you just like make some like cool thing on a weekend and it happens to be saved in your company's like drafts and you leave the company and you lose all your like Figma stuff, right? And they're sort of like, you know, or like an Instagram account that gets locked out or whatever it is, right? This like idea that we don't have control of our own stuff. And I think now with that in mind, that it's like maybe a little bit more grounded than like the privacy aspect, like what is your, what, what is you and your personality and your memories and your things that you choose to share with others? Like, are those, I mean, they're out of control for you. That means that they're in control of someone else is in control of them, right? If that makes sense. And I don't know, I'm pretty public with like what I do, you know, I post on various social media places and stuff, but I don't share too much. You know, I'm, I'm not on any of the two extremes myself. I think it was, um, um, a Grace Walker you interviewed. Uh, and she said something interesting, which like stuck with me. I don't know why there's many interesting things from that interview, but that she lived kind of a minimal life or lifestyle, but she didn't let that get be imposed on her work or something like that. And so I think that that, that is an interesting thing that I don't know why my brain bridged over to that now, but it's an interesting link between like how, like what the expression that we have sort of like in our work versus like the way we live, you know? Hey friends, it's Rob from The Edits. Wow, what a season three we've had. Just one episode left, then we wrapped up, and I'm gonna take a break to focus on my landing page course. More on that another time, but if you wanna stay updated, visit showthem.com. Okay, back to the interview. Okay, so your typeface needs like a little inter introduction. 6.3 billion times served in the last week, two million sites. You've smashed variables, you've done italics what's what's left to do with inter i love how you said you can compartmentalize like a little bit of work here and there and stuff but like what's next for you is it done i don't think a type is like interest ever done i mean the 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 purpose of interest is to be like a workhorse right it's like different people subscribe to different ideas but like i think that the design is very much a tool and very much distinct from art and 
when I use the sign to solve a problem, it is like about, it's, it's not always about efficiency, but that's kind of like the mindset, right? So like, I want to find one typeface that I can just like solve all my problems with, right? And that, okay, done. Now I can focus on other things, right? It's almost like the international typographic style or said the Swiss style, you know, um, went out sort of like grew in the fifties, like this idea of the, let the content do the communication rather than the, uh, the, you know, let, let, let things have substance, you know, beyond the surface, right? So instead of having a, a poster with in, incredible, like elaborate sort of like hand, hand lettering that just said, hello, right? Instead, like just set it in accidents, grotesque or whatever is popular at the, like early on, you know, and then you have, have a really clever message and maybe you pair that with some graphic that really like makes the, the person who like reads this really and, and then hears that in the voice, like starts thinking about something and gets to something deeper. I don't know. I'm on a tangent, but so this is kind of like, you know, this is a bit of like the reason why I work in there. And so in that context, in the light, right, you're never quite done. I mean, there, there was like a, a new revision to Helvetica that came out, I don't know, four or five years ago, Helvetica now, right? And that Helvetica, how how many years have then essentially been working on Helvetica, right? So you could keep working on Inter for another 10, 20 years, and I'm sure that there are things to do, things to improve. Like, I take pride in, like, finding, you know, uh, going deep on something, you know, like in... There might be like a Hungarian omelet or something. I'm like making shit up now. But, you know, there's like, there are these very specific things where I'll find out like Vietnamese, for example, like I did a deep dive on Vietnamese, I don't know, six, eight months ago. And there's some diacritics, like kind of the things at the top of the characters that are just like distinct in, in Vietnamese typography and like a native Vietnamese reader would sort of like, Maybe not be able to tell you what's wrong, but they will definitely feel it, if you know what I mean. Like, you can have strong intuition of, uh, like, if I read, if I just read, like, uh, prose or something in a language that I'm familiar with, and someone else looks at that with a translation book, they are they are not going to be equipped, really, to feel the nuance. And so stuff like that. So there's, like, plenty of things, like Cyrillic, for example. Like, I have, I'm not a native Cyrillic speaker or writer at all. I cannot read any Cyrillic uh, script. So I've just done the best I can, and I'm sure it's not that great, right? And so, yeah, there's uh, thousands of hours of work easily. It feels like it's a it forever <laughs> learning project. Like this could be your life's work. This could this could continue till the day you die, oh, basically. Easy, I yeah. mean, this, the, how many language? Yeah, it's so cool. So this is such a good segue. We've got a question here from a Vijay Verma. Rasmus, I'm a big fan of your work and really dug your talk about typography at the Figma Conf last year. I have a question regarding font creation that I want to maybe make someday. There are already numerous typographies available, but what key feature should one prioritize when designing new professional fonts that stands out and balances legibility with aesthetics? Mm. Okay. There's a couple of questions baked into one here, I feel. There's sort of like, one is like, you know, how do you think about like making a typeface? But it sounds like VJ here is, uh, it's already like gotten started on that and it's, it's maybe figured that part out. If like legibility is first off, I think it's like kind of subjective and should be, tr it should not be treated as like something very intuitive. It's, it, it comes easy to think of legibility as something that you can intuit, something where if I just like try a bunch of things and look at them in various ways myself, I, I can see if it's like good or bad. I think in practice, it's actually really hard to do without like doing some proper research of like, you know, other people in different conditions, right? Reflective screen, transmissive screen, dark room, bright room, dark background, light background, low contrast, high contrast, full of color, right? Is it, is it in print? Is it, uh, you know, a low density print, right? There is like a wide spectrum of parameters. And then you have the human element too. Like, you know, some people wear glasses, but they haven't updated a prescription in 10 years, right? Like there's a, there's a wide range of, of things. And some people have, you know, issues with like focusing, right? So what is legible, I think is really complicated. And you gotta, if, you, if you're serious about that, you gotta just take the research route in my opinion. And... Now, like if, and it sounds like here, the idea is also that to make something 
stand out that's like being a unique person almost like a personality almost like a musical artist you know if you just sort of like want to make it big at least money wise as a musical artist you want to be unique right and so like how do you how do you become unique and be legible it sounds like they're opposite ends of a spectrum but i don't think that's true uh i think you can be unique i think i would start so you have to pick a place to start right i would start with the unique part I would do legibility last and I would do unique first, right? So I would just figure out what is the theme of this typeface, this project, right? Spend a year on it, whatever it is. Figure out like, you know, what earlier in in this episode, uh, and I hope it'll make it in the cut, but like we were talking a bit about like passion or, you know, why people do great work, right? And what kind of drives you. And, And Rob, you were saying curiosity is like a key to that. I would start there, okay, like, what am I excited about? What am I curious about, right? Because, like, without that spark, whatever you do, it's not going to be that great. And you want it to be great in the scenario. And then, okay, out of that, now you, 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 you shrunk the problem space from huge to, like, you know, smaller. And now within there, what is unique? Like, what haven't been done before, right? And, and it sounds like professional really means that, like, this is really not as art. This is for making money, right? So art is secondary, money is primary. Like now, what 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 do people want? What does the market want? Right, and finding that intersection, um, and then legibility, I would do again as like a, a you know a, a very methodical research project that maybe you budget two months for it, not two weeks. You know? Yeah. Wow. So just, and then starting off with like the, the I mean the alphabet wise, I know this is a massive one, but we're going to start off with English, and and some numbers and some punctuations and like get it out the door, get feedback, or are we going to try and just go wide? Oh, uh, with the character set? Yeah. Uh, I would certainly do the former. Like there, I, there are so many people who are much better at this than I am. Uh, like Ono oh type, for example, like James, like absolutely master at this stuff. And, and the people who work together with him, um, arrow type. There's, there's a couple of people who, sh- who do a lot of sharing on social media. Uh, that would do a much better job than I could ever do, like giving ideas about how to start. But I think they will all say, you know, start with a couple of key characters and find that personality, you know. And then, you know, uh, a D grows uh, into a G, grows into a C. You know, there's meta letter forums are like very closely related shape-wise, right? Some very obviously geometrically are related, like O and, and C, lowercase C and, and lowercase O are very similar, but they don't have to be. A, a lowercase C could be like much more closely related to a lowercase G, right? Depending on like the style you're doing. So like start with a couple of letters and just, yeah, I think find that, find that vibe and, or whatnot. And based on your combo with Steve Shogo, uh on Twitter, don't start with the letter S. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's... Uh, Everyone, I think most people who like get into type design will will find a letter that they like will, can never nail. For me, it's like S and lowercase like G, like the single story lowercase G. It's yeah, it's a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a question here from Saleo that says, Rasmus, what are your favorite examples of seeing Inter out in the wild? Uh, oh, there are so many. There are so many examples. I always like it just fills my heart with warmth. I mean, there's there's some big ones you mentioned earlier, like one NASA. I found out I I met some people who work at NASA, and they were like, "We've been using it like for instrumentation and stuff." We, uh, I was like, you know, I had to like lie down for a while, you know, and stare into the wall. No, for real, like as a kid, you know, it's like a huge like space nerd. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, and the, and the ISO, the International Standardization Organization. I'm like, Shh, okay, I made it, you know, or like my type, and like I can go die now. My type is like is it doesn't need me. It's like a child, you know. But I think like the my my favorite example has got to be like the small the smaller scale stuff, right? So I, I went to Chicago maybe, I don't know a year and a half ago, and we got off the airport, me and my wife, and and sat down at the at the subway. And before like before the door closed and it it went away, like I looked on the other opposite side, you know, subways. You have the you have like a wall just next to it, and there's like posters, and there's like a poster for like a hair salon or something. And it's like, it's, you know, it's not, it's not going to be like, uh, you know, a big New York firm who liked the, the graphic design. It was some sort of thing. It was pretty good, but it was like in intern. And I was like, wait, what? It's Google Fonts doing its distribution. Yeah. Oh, whatever it is. 
to me, like that emotional connection, that's like, wow, okay, this is why I like, spent all of this, like, of my free time and donate all of this effort. That's the reason. And I was like, whoever you are, heart shape, you know, that's awesome. So good. So we got a good question here from Roy Quiller that goes, with Inter, should we use custom letter spacing for different text sizes or stay default? I mean, if you leave it default, it'll be fine. I think for all typography, all digital typography, you if you want it really good, you're just going to have to, to track it depending on the optical size, right? That just has to do with the, just how we perceive stuff. The rule of thumb is like the optically larger. And I mean, like if you measure, if you take a tape measure to your screen, right? Not pixels, because that, you know, you got to figure out a different way of measuring this. Like the optical size, like the larger something is, the more, the more detail you can have and, and the tighter you want it. And the smaller something is, or the fussier it is, right? Or like maybe some people are reading it through a screen or something like that, the, the wider you want the spacing to be. That's the rule of thumb. And you can play around with that. But I would, I would, if, if someone really cares, I would definitely just like decide on a couple of, a couple of sizes and tracking values or come up with like a, a mathematical formula for it. So I'm like, I'm digging deep in your site, Wayback Machine, in 2011 using Helvetica, and you're pairing it with Georgia. Yeah. Like way back. So I want to know, give me a couple of serifs that pair beautifully with Inter, in your opinion. Okay. So I'm not a person who, or I'm not no longer <laughs> a person who does like much type like pairing. Um, I used to be a maximalist with, with typography, I think in like the 2000s maybe, and now I'm, I'm a bit of a minimalist, but I think Georgia is, is like this very underrated typeface, you know, it comes licensed than like most operating systems, especially like <clears throat> the Italic version. It's like a true Italic version of Georgia. I think it's really beautiful. Um, it's got these really like, almost like swashes, you know, this kind of like hefty little sort of like things going on. I think it's really beautiful. That I think works really well with any sort of grotesque sans serif, like, like intro or Helvetic accidents or whatever. Barreling is like a pretty typeface. Dido is like a, a classic sort of, I think it's, it's got a, like a really, you know, some, some like things become associated with something. Like if someone has like a, a Mercedes G wagon, you're like, oh, they're probably like criminal or something like that, you know? But they don't have to be, but it's like associated with like, you know, bad, like baddies in movies and stuff. So I think that there's, there's some associations with Dido and, you know, fashion, but I think it's like inherently a beautiful typeface. What's rad for me on One Page Love is that, you know, I now tag sites with typefaces. So we have our custom taxonomy within WordPress and I get to tag them. And, you know, I've added 8,500 sites now, loaded up about 850 typefaces. And I get so stoked when I, I find one that I haven't like created in the in the system yet. You know, like this is a, a fresh typeface. Or it's like old and like someone was mm -hmm. brave enough to just throw it in. You know, the, the typefaces for me that are used the least are like the, the most interesting for me. But uh, yeah, anyway, like as you saw on Twitter, but props, uh, Inter just overtook Open Sans. Now it's the most popular font or typeface on One Page Love. But uh, interesting as the ones like that have fading in the archives, like Gotham. And, you know, like those are all like kind of, they went through a phase where there was a popular font. Um, mm -hmm. Proxima Nova. Yeah. So, so popular. Just fading, fading, fading. On the local first podcast, I was shocked to learn that you had a near death experience, you know, like just from overworking back in the day. A question here from. Pedro Duarte from Raycost. More and more people are starting off their careers working at startups. And although working at startups can be fun and challenging, it also has its drawbacks. That startup mindset, the hustle, the unclear compensation scheme, the uncertainty. So I'm curious because you've been at Spotify since day one and you've also worked at many other successful startups. So what advice would you give to these people who are just starting off to prevent them from making some of the same mistakes as you did? Oh yeah, I think this is a, a great question. Very important to ask yourself this and like really think about it. I think the, 
the easiest thing first, like compensation. So working for a smaller company, you will always have like a lower base salary. And I wouldn't focus too much on that. It's like, just make sure that you can live a, a decent life on that base salary, right? That's like your safety net. Like, yeah, make sure that it's enough so that you don't have to like worry about money. And I mean that on a low level, not on like, oh, so I can have my yachts or whatever. No, it's like, you know, you don't have to worry about like, can I eat this this week, right? Um, you know, do I have clothes without holes in them? That's, you know, if you pass the level, I think you'll be fine. Can I pay my rent? You know, stuff like that. Then the, you know, equity, just like, there's a, a wide range of equity compensation depending i think it's a, very much depending on in where in the world you are if you're like in silicon valley generally people are very like aware of these things so very few companies is going to try to sort of like be sheep on you and so you're probably going to get a pretty good deal um and what a good deal is really depends on like how early you are if you're employee number two then you probably want a percent of the company or something if you're employee number like 15 maybe you know that's too much to ask for but you don't want to sit there and be like, oh yeah, maybe you'll get two shares like that might dilute and stuff. Anyway, okay. So that's the easy part. Just figure that out, right? Those are the expectations I would have. They're working all the time. Some pe I've met some people who actually really like this. Um, and for and until maybe until a year ago, I would have said that there is a singular way of doing things that I think is healthy. And maybe I've, I've, maybe I changed my mind about that a little bit. By the way, anyhow, my like fairly strong opinion about this is uh, life is super short. It's much shorter than we think it is. And friends and, and family are like, and relationships are like really the only things that, that have any lasting value. And everything else is sort of like stuff along the road, right? And it's really important that you enjoy that road that you're walking. And so with these metaphors... If you go into a startup and they ask you to work like weekends and all, work all the time, even if no one says it, but you know, you kind of do what people, what other people do, if that's the culture, if you don't absolutely love this shit, you got to just like burn out pretty quickly and that's got to be terrible. And burning out like doesn't just mean like you're, you know, that you're, you sad and, and feel down. It also means that you probably lost your friends and partners or pets or you know, whatever like are in the moment feel like okay sacrifices for this like thing that is so exciting like uh like the best drug in the world you know it's, it's a very enticing very very powerful feeling to feel needed and to feel that like the thing you can contribute is 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 really valuable right which is i think is like why it's so easy to get there with, with playbit like from like before it, the company had even been incorporated before we had in place anything like this i was like this company, although being a startup, like we're, we are nine to five, five days a week. I tried to make this super clear. I, I tried to be very, very careful to never myself work on the weekends. And if I ever have to, I will just wait to like show any of that work until the, the week. Right. So there are startups out there that are like not following the sort of like, this has got to be the grind. Um, and I realize I'm, I'm like, you know, this a pretty long answer, but well, final thing is. I think that there's a correlation to young founders and the grind, right? For a life, maybe a very obvious reason, right? Like when we are younger, we just like on average tend to have a lot fewer commitments in life in terms of hobbies and families and health and whatever it is, right? And and like as we like get older and older, we tend to just like pick up more interesting things along the way. Like, oh, I, you know, like to play soccer. I'm going to start doing that. And like, I like to cook. I'm going to spend time on cooking. And we, you know, like have a kid or like uh, marry another person or like have roommates or whatever it is. Like, it's almost like as we go on, we put like really, really good things we like to have like in our backpack. Right. Uh, but that makes us like walk a little slower. And uh, if if you're like 19 years old and you start a company and you're like, why wouldn't we work all the time? Like, like what else do you do in your life? Like I just sleep four hours a night and then I work. Like, why can't you do that too? Right. And so, uh, like if this is something you care about, like one way of like finding startups that are maybe like on the other side of the spectrum is to look for founders that are maybe, you know, professionally older or have done this a few times before, or it's just in a different life situation. And now I want to just loop this back to what I was saying, like five, 10 minutes ago. 
uh, that I've changed my mind maybe about this a little bit. So I've spoken with a bunch of people about this, like many points in time. And a few times I've met people who have had like very legitimate sort of like um, sort of experiences that have reflected upon and in even in retrospect are like, no, actually like that was the right thing for me, the grind, you know, that excitement and that drug, you know, that sort of that pull and that like amazing feeling of feeling needed and part of a tribe and like that, which is an incredible feeling really was worth it. You know, I'm like the trade-offs I've made, like it was, it was fine. Like even in retrospect, I wouldn't change a thing. So I think that I wouldn't take this as like, you know, uh, what is the expression? Like as sort of like an absolute truth that thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that there, there is always like some, uh, some variance in this. Yeah. That hype, especially when things are working and you're getting traction. And you had that launch and it's working. It must be just, a, it must be like dopamine on steroids. Yeah. And it's like, everyone's just got this fuel, but then, you know, things dip and then, yeah, the burnout. Yeah. I mean, my journey, um, you know, I've, we actually try to create the Facebook um, for music. It was called Rock Lifestyle. And it was like years ago, like I, I lived in England for a while and we got investment gray suits at the airport, green tea, you know, like, like just, I, I did it and it was rad because it was a small part of my life and I tasted it a little bit. You know, we were so naive, dude. Like we, we didn't even have any customers and we, we got hosting with Rackspace. Oh, I remember Rackspace. Yeah. Yeah, dude. So is it, but it was like, I don't know, it was like $200 a month or something. Do you have any people? Like it was, it was so crazy, but I mean, you cannot pay for the lessons learned. It was absolutely incredible time. Um, but yeah, I, re I mean, that, that answer was phenomenal. Um, and I'm glad you turned it around. I mean, just want to go one level deep. Like, what is the sign you're burning out? What's the time you got to pull the, Like, what's the sign you got to pull a break? You know, it's happened to you a few times in your life. Like, if it happens now, like, what yeah. What are those mannerisms? I think now, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I'm trying to figure out what an answer might be. Because when I've been in that place, which I've, I've been like twice, I think, um, I didn't realize it, although I was like aware that this might happen until it already was in the rear view mirror, right? Um, again, that like feeling that we talked about, that incredible feeling, it's just so powerful that I think it's like hard to reach through it to see any problems. Um, I'm, I don't know. I'm just guessing here, and this is not from experience, so I might be totally wrong, but if I were in, okay, so if I were in the same situation again, and now, again, I said with play, but I'm not in that situation since we made, it's like very, very structured and, you know, we work regular nine to five days. So, but let's say we hadn't, right? I would probably write something down and post it and put it on my screen. That's a question to myself. That's like, have you said no to a friend who wanted to have coffee or something like that? You know, have you like declined uh, 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 like an outreach from a friend because of work? Because that, I think just looking back at everything I was doing, like those were often the things that, that in retrospect regretted doing that I did in favor of like that drug thing, you know, you know, there might be a friend who's like, oh, we, we you know, we're, we're going on this like trip over the weekend to, to do this thing. Or like, we're gonna, we're gonna go out like in the summer and like swim in a lake or something. And it's like, I'm like, that's like, what is that? Six hours. Oh my God. Six hours. That's like an ocean. No, sorry. You know, we gotta work. So right? interesting. And in the moment, it's like, yeah, like, you know, I can go swimming in a lake or whatever. I've done that a hundred times. Like this thing right here though, is like the whole world. If like this one button or this icon is not perfect, like everything is gonna fall. That's how it feels, right? In the moment. And so in the moment, it feels like the right trade-off. But in retrospect, it's very, very clear to me at least that it's the wrong trade-off. And it didn't at all matter, the icon. And, and hey, spending time with friends like, was way more valuable, right? So that's the post that I will put on the floor, on the wall. That will be like a question to myself. That's like, have you declined a social invitation from a friend because you wanted to do work and stuff? And if the answer is yes, I will be like, oh, warning. It's just, it's you like know? a flag. And now it's time to just step back and you're like, cool, let's just take a moment. It's just on the family and stuff. It's like, yeah, like now I want to be a good dad. Mm -hmm. I want to be there. Um, like what you're saying about your family sending this constraints at five o'clock, like good for you, dude. Like, yeah, uh, I want to, I want to be a good dad. I want to be a, a, you know, online less, but at the same time, just be intentional all the time. Like we were right back to the beginning of the conversation. I love it. 
<laughs> yeah. Rasmus, I, c- I could rap forever, dude, but let's call it. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. We covered like a lot of ground. It was cool. We had a laugh. Um, where can the Yo podcast people follow your journey online? Uh, well, Mastodon or Twitter. I'm mostly active on Twitter. Um, you can, you can search my name on Twitter. That's probably like the only social place where I like post publicly these days. Cool. So at RSMS and RSMS.me, your website. That's right. Yeah. Or you can type in my name in like a search engine and there might be some like hockey players and some more famous, you know, some actually famous people out there, but that's a couple of keywords and you'll find me. Final question on the buzzer. I'm deep diving your Spotify playlist and there's no ABBA in there, dude. What happened? Oh, there's no ABBA? Uh, it's no ABBA, dude. Yeah. You know, I got a quick story about ABBA. <laughs> I was at Spotify and this was pretty early on. And, you know, kind of small company. And then someone rings the door and I just like go open it. And this is like all the fella, you know. So, oh, welcome in, you know. People came in, went all the time and like had lunch or whatever. It's like, uh, do you do you want a coffee or something? And he's like, yeah, sure. And it's like kind of interested. And we had we had a, a group of people who were really into coffee, and so you know we went and we kept talking about our random stuff, and we made some coffee, and you know we had coffee, and then like came uh, uh, Daniel, the, um, one of the founders of the company, came by, and he was going to have a meeting, and they went and had a meeting, and then like a colleague came out to me, and was like, oh my god, oh my god, you had coffee with Benny? I was like his name was Benny who's like who's that guy it's like it's one of the other people I was like what <laughs> I had no idea I was like what <laughs> I was, was just a nice guy who likes coffee <laughs>